Welcome back. On our last episode, we began a study of the most difficult problem facing Christians and believers in God. It is the problem of evil. In that episode, we talked about what evil is. We defined evil. Evil is the corruption of a good thing. And as we talked about on our last episode, evil cannot exist on its own. It requires a good thing in order to exist. Evil's not a substance. It is the corruption of a good thing. Evil is like rot on a tree. Evil is like rust on a car. Evil is like a wound on your arm. Evil is like a moth hole in a sweater. So evil exists because good in some way has become corrupt. We talked briefly about the origins of evil. And as we discussed, I believe Evil exists because man misused the good gift of free will. And we're going to talk more about the gift of free will in this episode. We wrapped up the last episode by talking about the types of evil, that there are two basic types of evil. There's moral evil, which the Bible calls sin, and there is also natural evil. We would place illnesses like cancer or coronavirus under the category of natural evil. We would also call things like hurricanes and tornadoes, earthquakes, anything that brings pain and suffering into the life of a person that is not directly connected with moral evil falls under the umbrella of natural evil. Now, to understand the Bible's answer, where does evil come from? Why does it exist? The Bible assumes a few basic principles. It assumes that God exists, that God is good, that everything God created is good, that man misused the gift of free will that God gave him, and that man's sin brought evil into the world. We don't have time to examine the truthfulness of those premises, so for the sake of this episode, we will assume that God exists that he is good, and that everything he created was good. Which brings us around to this question of, do we have free will? Now, there are some people who believe that free will is an illusion, but I believe it is very real. It's something that we experience. It's something that not only does the Bible teach us that we have, but we intuitively know that we have it. So let's talk about this good gift of free will. On our last episode, I brought up Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. God commands uh, man and woman, You may surely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God says every tree in the garden is open for consumption. You can eat the fruit in, in every tree except for one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he sets a consequence if they eat of that tree. And the consequence implies that man had the power to choose. God gave man the gift to freely choose whether or not he would follow God's command. This isn't the only passage in the Bible that teaches us about free will. If we go over to Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Paul talks about the Gentiles. He's already proved in the book of Romans that the Gentiles could uh, discern God's existence through the testimony of nature. He does that back in chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He comes back to the Gentiles in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 and says this, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Now the phrase the law represents the law of Moses, and in particular the moral code that we find in the law of Moses. What Paul is saying is the Gentiles, in discerning that God exists through the testimony of nature, In that belief, they could discern right from wrong. There is a morality that flows from believing in God. I like to think of it this way. Every law requires a lawgiver. There is a universal moral law. 
therefore God exists. That's the essential point that Paul is making in these two verses. They did the things within the law, even though they did not have access to the law of Moses, which tells us that the Gentiles were able to freely choose to do what was right, based on their belief in a creator that they discerned through the testimony of nature. That's in a nutshell what he's saying in those two verses. So free will does exist, and the Gentiles that Paul's talking about in these two verses show the exercise of free will. But we don't need the Bible to tell us that free will exists. We know it intuitively. We have all experienced it. I like what C.S. Lewis says in the last paragraph of his first chapter in his book, Mere Christianity. This is what he writes. These then are the two points I want to make. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. Secondly, that they do not in fact behave in that way. We all can relate to what Mr. Lewis is saying. We've all had moments when there's something inside of us that is telling us to act a certain way. Call it an instinct, call it an impulse. This is what James is talking about in James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So we all can relate to what C.S. Lewis is describing. We all can relate to that impulse. There's something inside of us that is telling us to do what's right. The Bible calls this the conscience. And yet we find occasions when we do not act in accordance with that impulse. Something is telling us to do what's right and we choose to do otherwise. This to me demonstrates the existence of free will. I have this impulse. I feel a certain way. This feeling is telling me to act in a certain way. And yet I don't act in that way. Why is that? Because even though my conscience is telling me to act in a certain way, I don't have to. I have free will. I can choose to act in a way different from how I feel. Now, it's important to realize that free will is not absolute, that it operates within constraints. A couple of years ago, our family took a vacation to Yosemite Valley in California, and there's this beautiful uh mountain face, granite mountain face called El Capitan. It's about 3,000 feet tall. People love to climb El Capitan. It's, uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a thing to see. The quickest way to get from the top of El Capitan to the valley floor is to jump off that cliff without a parachute. And someone could freely choose to jump off El Capitan in the hopes of reaching the valley floor, floor quite quickly. However, they cannot freely choose whether or not they will live when they hit because gravity and human physiology are going to rule out whether or not you can choose to live. So our, our freedom to choose operates within natural law, within the natural constraints that God has placed upon the created realm. We could illustrate it another way with the game of chess. If you're familiar with the game of chess, you know that each one of those pieces has a certain way it can move. Did you know that we've not been able to calculate how many possible moves there are in the game of chess? We just don't have the computing power or the time to estimate, to accurately estimate how many games of chess are possible. And so most chess experts conclude that there are an infinite number of possible games of chess out there. Now, what's interesting about that is chess is governed by some very simple rules. And yet that does not limit the amount of possibility that exists for a game of chess. And I think that that illustrates how free will operates in the life of a person. We are constrained by natural law, by moral law. And yet within those constraints, there is a tremendous amount of freedom to, to live and to choose. Adam and Eve could eat from every tree in the garden except for one. So they had freedom, but that freedom was within constraints. We run into trouble, though, when what we want to do conflicts with what God wants us to do. 
we feel a certain way or we believe that we were born a certain way and we want to act according to this. This is what's often called determinism. Determinism says I act a certain way because I was born that way. I have no choice. Some people will say something like this. God made me this way. I cannot choose otherwise. That's a form of determinism. But I would like you to think about something. If, if that's what you believe, please consider this. If God made you the way that you are, but tells you in his word to act differently, why would he condemn you for sin if you weren't able to choose otherwise? The fact that you are the way you are, but God tells you to choose a different path, means you are able to freely choose. Eve felt like that piece of fruit would make her wise, but she didn't have to act according to her feelings. She could have chosen otherwise. God would not tell you to act contrary to how you feel unless he believed, he knew that you were capable of making that choice. Now, here's something curious to think about. You may be disagreeing with what I'm saying, saying to yourself, that's not right. People are born the way they are born. They cannot change. You're just wrong, Wade. You ought to change. You ought to change. But if I was born this way, do I have the freedom to change? I have the freedom to change my thinking on free will but others are not free to choose what they believe or think or feel. So in summary, God is good. What he created is good, including this beautiful gift of free will. We know that free will exists because of the gift he gave, the command he gave to Adam and Eve. And we know it exists intuitively because we experience it all the time. But free will is not absolute. It operates within constraints. It operates within the constraints of natural and divine laws. And finally, the Bible says, no matter how you think or feel or what you believe about yourself, you can choose to follow the will of God. Now, in closing, I just want to remind us of why God gave us this powerful gift. Giving us free will came with the risk, and the risk was that evil would come into the world. But as we talked about on the last episode, God gave us this gift so that we could love as he loves, because true love requires or implies a choice. You can't be forced to love someone else. Remember, God chose to love us in spite of our sins, and he offered his son Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for those sins, because God chose to love us, we too can choose to love God and to love one another.